So I am here today with Sanjit Biswas, who is the CEO of Meraki, which last year was uh, acquired by Cisco. Um, Sanjit was a was a, St a Stanford undergraduate, and that's how I met him originally. Before he escaped to MIT and then started a very famous research project in wireless networking called the RoofNet project, where they built and then operated a peer-to-peer -peer network wireless system uh, across Cambridge, Massachusetts for MIT students. And uh, after that, Sanjit and uh, his colleagues started uh, Meraki, and um, Sanjit was the CEO for the duration of the company, and uh, they build cloud-managed Wi-Fi networks. In fact, the Wi-Fi network in the Gates Computer Science Building at Stanford and at many universities is based on Meraki. And uh, so it's a delight to have you here, Sanjit. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me, Nick. So in, um, let's get stuck in with some questions. In, in Unit 7 of the introduction, introduction to Computer Networks class that we teach, CS144, the students learn some of the basics uh, about wireless networking. In, in particular, they learn about how a wireless network is very different from a traditional wired network. Mm -hmm. And uh, the channel is different, interference, multipath, shadowing, and so on. It means that connections come and go, the data rate is always changing. Now, you, you learned a lot about these things in the RoofNet project, and uh, you had a lot of practical experience. So can you give us a quick overview of the RoofNet project at MIT and some of the things that you learned when you were deploying a real operational Wi-Fi network? Sure. So the basic idea behind RoofNet is we were trying to build a research prototype network that we could use to provide broadband to students across Cambridge, which is the city that has both uh, Harvard and MIT in it. Uh, it was called RoofNet because we were installing these antennas on students' roofs, writing mesh networking software that would route packets through the whole network and essentially provide bandwidth from a small number of, of sources on campus. Uh, what was interesting about that project is it was very much real world. So we had real world links, as you mentioned. So we saw very interesting wireless behavior that was very different from what we saw in simulation. Uh, we had routing protocols that we had to write and deploy in a production environment. And then we had real students with real traffic. Uh, and all of those were interesting factors. So I think you touched on some of the most fascinating things that we saw, which is that links um, behave differently than people originally thought. I think the, the belief at the time 10 years ago was that links either worked or they didn't. So if you could receive an advertisement that a link was operational, then you could route traffic over it. What we discovered is many links would deliver 30% of their packets, or 70%. And that number would change over time. It would change by modulation. Uh, it would change by interference. So if there's someone else in the network transmitting at that time, a link that used to deliver 80% of the packets would only deliver 20%. So there's self-interference. Um, so those are kind of fascinating link level issues. As we kind of moved up the stack, we noticed applications actually had a big impact on how the network behaved. So you'd have a student running BitTorrent, and all of a sudden, you know, 100 other students were affected because that one person was downloading a gigabyte uh, file or something like that. So I think you, you had a kind of layering of issues, uh, which made it for uh, very fascinating research, and I think is, that's what led us to a lot of the conclusions that you saw in the papers out of my, MIT in the RoofNet project. So your your first product, if I remember right, was a uh, was a mesh network where where the packets were carried from uh, from essentially from laptop to laptop until they reached the edge of the network or reached a point where they would uh, connect to a wireline into the into the public internet, and uh, so that's how that's how RoofNet worked. And then the first products of Meraki um, that was pretty unusual at the time. People had talked about that for a while, um, and uh, it, it was that idea persisted. It has. So the the meshing concept is still in the product. Uh, what we noticed is over time. That, that was considered novel, especially from a research perspective. As we commercialized what we built, uh, we were getting asked to do other things that were beyond the scope of mesh networking. So for example, making the network just simply easy to deploy and manage. Uh, and that's IP addressing, user management, uh, remote monitoring, all that kind of stuff, uh, is where we ended up spending a lot more time. But our products, even today, still uh, have mesh built in. And uh, so if I remember right, the um you know, very early on, you were man you were essentially managing other people's networks for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I seem to remember you telling me that there was even a monastery somewhere in Tibet that you were uh, that you were yeah. managing. So, so you began to learn you really learn about how to remotely manage other people's networks for them, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think that actually started with RoofNet, where we were the ISP. Uh, and we is a strong word. There were only three of us who were grad students at the beginning. The team didn't get that large, but we were you know, writing software, uh, managing the network, teaching, kind of doing all those things. As we started Meraki, we were doing that on behalf of some of our early customers as well. And that's where we ended up building up a tool set that ended up being really valuable to network operators because we could appreciate the kind of problems they had. So, so nowadays, uh, if I understand correctly, most of your customers, their, their, their network is managed remotely or at least configured remotely from one of your data centers in Sunnyvale and various other places around the world. So what, what benefits do your customers get? Or what, what benefits do the users get from having this sort of centrally cloud-managed um, Wi-Fi network? Yeah, you know, when you have a single device, management's not really a big concern. You configure it once, you set it, and you forget it, and that's, that's it. That's typically, you know, most home routers like a Linksys or Netgear, Apple Airport fit that kind of concept. When you have uh, tens of devices, hundreds or thousands of devices, the configuration and management and keeping them consistent uh, between different access points or switches or routers ends up being a big deal. Uh, so that's really the benefit is the consistency and then being able to see what the network was doing uh, even if you're a thousand miles away. So a lot of our customers today are either schools with you know uh, large campuses or their uh, universe or sorry enterprises who have uh, branch sites around the world. And for them to have centralized IT be able to very easy, easily deploy and manage a network uh, is compelling just from a practicality perspective. They just don't have enough hours in the day to go you know, SSH to remote devices and try to configure them and cross their fingers and hope the thing works. So if I'm a big company like, I don't know, Ford Motor Company that has many offices around the world, um, it allows a central IT organization then to manage and maintain... That's exactly right. So from Detroit, they could manage all of their dealerships and make sure they have consistent guest Wi-Fi, they have consistent policies. If they have a security update, uh, they can deploy it very easily, those kinds of things. Uh, which in in kind of previous years had been a real pain uh, for a network administrator. So technically, how is that different from from a traditional or a typical Wi-Fi network? Yeah, so I think the biggest difference is in the implementation. So traditional Wi-Fi networks had what was known as a controller, so an appliance that we, you'd install in a data center or a rack somewhere in the back of the office. That controller provided that centralized management configuration. That works fine if you have a single site. If you have dozens or hundreds of sites, that sort of breaks down. And so what we did is by essentially providing a virtualized web service that did all of that for you, uh, we eliminated that piece of complexity. The other is we handle all the upgrades, all the software management. So as we we're coming out with you know new ideas, new traffic shaping policies and rules, all of our customers benefit from that. In the past, that would have required upgrading the controller appliance, which often just didn't get done. So networks would kind of get stuck in time at the point they were installed. And with the way things are changing so quickly, uh, you know, a new iPad gets released, and you need a new form of traffic management so you can you know, provide a good experience for it. That was breaking down and becoming very brittle. So that's really the big difference. It's very practical. I see. So if I understand correctly, all of that functionality is in the access point. That's yeah. right. And then the access point, the only other entity is that the access point is connecting directly back to the yeah. cloud manager back in the... Exactly. So the data plane, uh, all the traffic is being forwarded directly to the internet. All the, the kind of higher level management reporting, statistics collection, that's all done in the cloud. And then the firmware on the device can be upgraded um, on a regular basis, so perhaps once every few months. And that kind of gives you the software-defined nature down at the edge. So if you come up with a new policy or um, you know, a, some new firmware feature, you can easily deploy that. If we have a new UI feature, we can deploy that within a day and everyone sees it. I see. So with, with you having that sort of access or your servers having that access and control to everybody's Wi-Fi access points, presumably yeah, yeah. some people get a little nervous about security and privacy and things like this. Right. Um, you know, is, that a, is that a common concern and how, how do you overcome those concerns? Yeah, it is a common concern, and I think it's, it's a good one for customers to have. Uh, we're not the only cloud service most businesses use. In fact, you know, it's, whether they're using Gmail or Salesforce.com or one of these other services, I think customers these days are be becoming wise to the ways of the cloud and asking the right questions. So how do you retain your data? Um, how much of this data is going to the cloud? Who can see it? Where are your data centers? How are they managed? All those kind of questions. So what we do is we just try to shine a bright light on it and be as straightforward as possible. So we have a little website at meraki.com trust, 
and the customer can learn about the architecture of the system, um, who runs our data centers under the covers, and all that kind of stuff. And so, from a from a technical point of view, how does how does that work? Mm -hmm. uh, so, presumably, you secure the connection between the access point and your and your server. You, yeah. you can think of it as an IPsec tunnel. Um, it's running the equivalent of uh, Google protocol buffers over it. So the amount of bandwidth is very small. It's about a kilobit per second. And that's in aggregate. It's, it's all of the kind of statistics collection and so on. Uh, the real difference is that it's, it is encrypted um, in the same way that you would expect with public key encryption. Yeah, OK, all right. And uh, no, no, that's, kind of, that's kind of interesting. So with, and, and with all this um, sort of interest in SDN and uh, in class, we, Martin Casado came and gave a talk. So uh, everyone's up to speed <laughs> on software-defined networking. Um, so many, you know, many people believe more and more that networks are going to be managed remotely by software running at least outside the physical data plane. They may not be running in the cloud, but uh, they may not be managed from the cloud, but they're going to be managed from somewhere outside of the data plane. Uh, you seem to be doing that already. Do you, do you think that all networks will be cloud managed in the future, and that the software will be um, sort of this this clean separation between the software control and the data plane. Is, is that kind of inevitable, do you think, for Wi-Fi networks and you know, networking environments you operate? Well, so networking is such a big uh, market segment that it's, it's hard to make a blanket statement at all. But I think most certainly will be. And it's, it's really, again, kind of practicality. We've seen people move from an on-premise based email approach with Microsoft Exchange or you know, running their own SMTP and IMAP servers and all that kind of stuff to moving things to you know, Gmail or a hosted approach on email. It makes logical sense that um, things like managing network infrastructure will move to the cloud as well. And what we're hearing from a lot of our customers, it could be big or small, they just find it simpler. So I, I think the world tends to prefer efficiency and simplicity. So the short answer is yes. I think most networks over the next five, 10 years will move to this cloud managed model. And, and if I understand it correctly, it's not just Wi-Fi access points. It's um, switches, physical switches for, for wired networks as well. That's right. So it switches and also uh, routers or security appliances, so kind of the gateway device that yep. connects between uh, the service provider and the uh, local area network. So what we discovered is originally we started out building wireless products. We built indoor and outdoor products. We were uh, kind of coming out with every shape and size. And then customers were saying, this is wonderful. Um, I have a tremendous amount of visibility and management on the wireless network, but I also have a lot of wired devices, whether they're PCs, point-of-sale terminals, printers, security cameras, phones, that kind of stuff. Uh, could you provide that the management over the wired network? And so now we just do all of it. And it, it works really well together because consistency is, is really what people are looking for. They want to set a policy and then just have it go across the entire business. So do you think this will start being the way that my home network, my Wi-Fi and general home network will be managed in the future by outsourcing the management to the cloud? Uh, it could be. Um, you know, we didn't address that specific use case. Um, the, the kinds of products and the way that consumers buy is a little different than the way businesses buy. So we ended up focusing on the kind of enterprise or campus use case. Uh, I do think we will see more consumer products managed from the cloud. So I just recently installed a Nest thermostat, uh, which I think are becoming pretty popular. It's a really cool experience being able to remotely, you know, change the settings of your temperature. And, you know, if you go on vacation, you can turn it down, all that kind of stuff. It might make sense for people to do that with their bandwidth as well. Uh, it's only a matter of time. Hang on, I'm just logging in here to change the temperature of your house. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope they've got it secured. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, do you, um, you know, when looking forward, um, when you're thinking about some of the, uh, you know, the problems that you have to solve, not only for Meraki but networking in general, and you're part of Cisco now and part of a bigger company, you know, what do you think that some of the interesting problems to work on. You've clearly been working on a fascinating new problem for the last few years. What do you think some of the interesting problems in networking are over the next few years? Yeah, you know, um, it's fascinating. Network evolves, networking evolves so quickly. Between the time that we started Meraki, which is about seven years ago, and today, our products have gotten roughly 100 times faster, um, which is pretty incredible, right? That's Moore's Law in action. Uh, the other thing we've seen is the number of devices connecting behind our, our networks has grown considerably. And you know, in 2006, the iPhone was just coming out as primarily PCs and laptops that would show up on these networks. Now it's really all these mobile devices. Uh, so I think the way things are headed is that's not going to stop. In fact, we talked about the Nest earlier, but you see things like the Fitbit scale 
and you know other other products connecting the Wi-Fi network. It's only a matter of time before lots and lots of devices are connecting, and I think that's going to be interesting because it, these are devices that may not have a UI attached to them where you can click on the network and type in a password. So yeah. I think that's going to lead to interesting questions about how do you authenticate um, these sort of UI-less devices. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, that's going to lead, of course, to capacity issues. When you have 1,000 devices on a single network, there's always contention. So I think there's going to be interesting problems there. And then uh, I think people always want these networks to be faster and more manageable. So all these problems, what's going on is the scaling of number of devices, the amount of bandwidth, uh, the number of sites, all that kind of stuff. So whenever you see that such rapid expansion, I think it creates a lot of new uh, research problems and problems for industry as well. So we have uh, 200 people in the in the CS144 class at Stanford this year. So there's mm -hmm. going to be lots of uh, lots of people sitting there that are going to go on to be entrepreneurs and uh, you know start their own businesses. Some successful, some probably not. Uh -huh. um, from your vantage point now, with the experience that you've had as a researcher, becoming an entrepreneur, starting a company, being a CEO, and then taking that company to be very successful. Um, what are the what what's the advice that you would offer to students sitting in class who would be thinking uh, thinking about doing the same thing? What would have been the advice that would have been useful to you to have heard at that time? Um, well, I think the the most interesting thing that I noticed about the journey was that we were able to figure out the challenges at every step along the way. You you just outlined, I think. Uh, what it takes to go from a startup to a company that has a significant amount of revenue and sales and so on. Every year the challenges were different. And I think the way we learned to think in grad school and even in undergrad as we were uh, learning about these kinds of problems in engineering classes ended up applying to the way we built the business. So essentially figuring things out from first principles. I remember I think I was in your CS244 class where we had to write a TCP stack and FTP clients and just make it work. And you know, that that's kind of what you're doing when you're building a business, is you have an idea of what you're trying to build. You have an idea of what the interfaces are. And then you need to build an implementation. And a lot of times I think students think, oh, I need someone who's been to business school or I need an expert in the field. And the reality is uh, folks at Stanford and other schools of similar caliber are very, very smart. And you'd be surprised what you can figure out on your own. So I wish I'd known that, that it wasn't going to be impossible. Um, you know, in, in many ways, we also got lucky, but it's certainly worth trying, and, and I think uh, it's a great experience for everyone to give a shot. So have confidence in your own abilities, and uh, don't worry too much about others who have been struggling at the same problem for years. Just buckle in and buckle down, and uh... yeah, and it's almost like don't look too much at the related work. Just just go, you know, try to do something on your own and uh, figure it out from first principles, and you'd be surprised. I think um, a lot of people think that there's uh, there's a lot of mastery required, and if you think about most of the very successful companies in Silicon Valley, a lot of them were founded by students who had never done it before. So it definitely can be done. Wonderful. That's great advice. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time, Sanjit. Great. Thanks, Nate. Bye-bye now.